Right. Uh, welcome to the first session on aircraft performance and stability. <clears throat> this particular one will look at the units, so basic introduction. So obviously the aircraft industry is dominated by both Boeing and Airbus, European and American aircraft manufacturers. Both of these use different um, unit systems. Obviously, there's the metric system, one I'm probably most familiar with, but obviously the Americans, being the wonderful people that they are, like to use the Imperial system. So a bit, bit of an introduction to that and then a quick overview on the engines and the basic parameters, how they work, why we select them, and a quick overview of thrust corrections in this. Right, the module itself, uh, aircraft performance, isn't necessarily focusing on engine manufacturing, but what it is needs to just have a touch on is an understanding of what types of engines there are, why we use them, the limitations, etc. Obviously, because some of these terms and parameters are needed in the calculations that you'll see later on. Right. The unit is a quick worksheet that's attached to this unit, this module. Um, it's worksheet number one. It gives you an introduction of the metric system and the imperial system. I quickly jump out and find that. All right, in this sheet, you'll find the majority of the key things that you need to know in terms of units and parameters. Some of them you may not have met before. Some of them you may have. But just to very quickly go over some of these as a quick uh, discussion. You scroll down to the bottom, you can see our units. The so specific fuel consumption is something I'm going to talk about very, very shortly. So I'll leave that for now. Um, Within the list, you'll find the four aircraft forces. We've got thrust, weight, there's a drag, and the lift is being the fourth one. All of these are forces measured in newtons in the metric system, or you'll notice here it's pounds with a little f to indicate pounds force for the imperial system. Um, a few of these are pretty obvious. Velocity, we've got meters per second. Obviously, the, the imperial unit involved is feet. Oh, we're just transferring meter to feet, which is then when we look a little bit further up, we've got acceleration due to gravity. We should be very familiar with 9.81. That's meters per second squared. All we're doing in the imperial system is converting meters to feet, which is to multiply by roughly 3.3. And so you get the 32.2, and that's feet per second squared too. Um, a little bit further down, range and endurance. You've got a session on both of these later in the unit. Endurance being how long you can last. And we'll talk about time, hours. Typically, it will be seconds, but obviously, you don't generally talk about an aircraft flying for 3,600 seconds, for example. Um, range. How far we can go. So that's typically measured in nautical miles, although your calculations will come out in meters or feet. Uh, and towards the bottom, a few things to be aware of. Temperature, you're going to see a few calculations in temperature. These require the absolute scale, so Kelvin and Rankine or metric imperial. Pressure, Pascals, the odd one out is in imperial it's pounds per feet squared not psi or pounds per inch squared it's feet is the distance and then the really odd one out over here is uh the density there it is right kilograms meter cube should be very happy with that but in imperial it's not pounds per feet cubed as you'd expect we introduce something called a slug you can see up here, if we do mass times gravity, we would be doing mass times 32.2 in the metric system. But to make our life easier, 
there's a conversion of one pound to slugs, which is also a ratio or the inverse of 32.2. So these two effectively cancel out. And the reason working slugs is now that one pound of mass ends up being one pound of force. Right, so that quickly covers the units. You need to make yourself very familiar with them. Back in the PowerPoint. Right, choices, propulsion. There's multiple choices that we can select. So obviously the piston engines, gas turbine engines, jet engines, slightly different. All do the same point of pushing the aircraft forwards, giving it thrust. But each of them have their own, you can see your characteristics, making them more suitable for different flight regimes. So it all then depends on what you want to do. All right, worth mentioning, the aircraft designer has no input on the engine. Basically, they'll come up with a design, they'll want to power up by a jet engine, for example, and need X amount of thrust. It then comes down to the engine designer, so this would be Rolls-Royce, General Electric, etc., to come up with a suitable solution for the aircraft designer, so for Boeing, for Airbus, etc. Right. Um, different ways you can measure the type of engine that you want. The first one I'll introduce you here is the thrust output to the weight. So it's thrust to weight ratio. Basically, it's pretty obvious how, what you want here is high amount of thrust. So we want this value to be as high as possible and produce an awful lot of thrust, but you want the engine weight to be as small as possible. So high thrust or low weight. It's one way of measuring the engine. It's not the most common way. Generally, the most common way that you see is something called the thrust specific fuel consumption. So, this is often given the letter CT. And you can see it says it's the ratio of fuel consumption to output. So, CT, we've got thrust on the bottom. So, how much thrust is our engine producing? And on top, if you look carefully, there's little dots that indicate it's a rate of flow. And this is the fuel. So you measure, you, basically you are accounting for how much fuel is passing through the engine every second for the amount of thrust being produced. All right, unit wise, just to make sure you're happy with this, unit wise, if you just I'll take this in metric just to make it a bit easier to see. The weight flow rate is how much weight of fuel, so to weight, how much weight of fuel passes point every second, newtons per second. On the bottom, we've got thrust, and that means we're dividing the weight flow rate, and divide that by the thrust which is then also measured in newtons all right just make this a little bit easier to see we technically divide that by one don't always write that one just makes it a bit easy to see what's going to happen next we've got one fraction divided by another first one stays as it is swap the sign in the middle Invert the right one, one so the one goes on top, Newton on the bottom, and you can see now that the top Newton cancels the bottom, leaving us with units of one or oh, seconds, or as you can see down here, that is per seconds or per hour, basically it's per unit time. The thrust or the force aspect cancel each other out. All right, if you think about what this one is, this is how much fuel you're using. So you want this value to be very low, and this value to be very high.
I want a low weight low risk, but you want a high amount of thrust. And so two things. This first one needs a high ratio or a high number. This value needs to be as low as possible or a low ratio. Lower you make that, the better. A okay. couple of graphs to have a quick look at. Not much to mention on them, it's just pointing a few things out. First one is the first ratio, which so we're talking about thrust to weight ratio. Rockets just produce a consistent amount of thrust no matter what speed you're going. So you'll find this is just a straight line. Nothing happens no matter what you're doing to the speed. What you generally find, if you look a bit further down, jet engines and turbo jets typically produce a constant amount of thrust. So you'll find these lines are fairly straight, although they start to curve off towards Mach 1. So once you get somewhere near the speed of sounds, the output starts to decrease. But the big one to mention here is these two here. So we've got this line and this one here. The two bold black lines. They're both propeller powered aircraft. So as you start to speed up, and you notice as we head towards Mach 1, head towards the speed of sound, these curves just disappear to zero. It's because of shockwave. So propeller, you can have to see if you head on. There's the hub. Propeller one, propeller two. So just make it a single propeller just to explain this. At the root, as this rotates in that direction, for example, at the root, its rotational velocity, its rotational velocity is fairly small. But the further you go from the hub outwards, this point, I have a much bigger. rotation velocity. So at the tip, we have a very high value. Obviously, even though we have a small value at the root, but much higher one at the tip, as you this speeds up and up and up, it's eventually going to hit, hit Mach 1. And one thing you definitely don't want on propeller powered aircraft is a shock wave. Not only does it destroy the airflow, the thrust, it will probably break or damage the propeller. Right, into the second graph, this is the sus specific fuel consumption now. So this is how much fuel you're using every hour. And it's pretty self-explanatory in that the faster you grow, the more fuel you're going to end up burning. Right, you'll notice the high bypass says Merely constant. The low bypass starts to increase once you get to Mach 1. And this is because of the shock where it forms. Obviously, it needs to power past any shock waves way beyond the transonic region. And after that, a little bit further up, you'll notice we then have the afterburner. This is the only way we're going to exceed Mach 1 effectively way into the turbo jets and transonic range. Right. Finally, very rarely do you get an after burn and turn up turbo fan. I'll explain this in a second, but it's just not one that's worth considering. Right. So on the graph, we've got piston engines. Quick overview how a piston engine works, just so you're happy with this. Not something that gets covered very often. Piston engines, limited to light aircraft, and these will typically use a propeller to finish, reduce the power in the output. 
Right, so there's four individual sections here. Each piston will do the same job, but at a different time. All right, so if you take one piston, it has to do the intake, then go through the compression, then the power, then the exhaust stroke. Right, first thing that happens then, in the first diagram, the exhaust valve, which is here, is shut. Air and fuel mixture is coming in. This piston is moving down. Now, so the working volume, which is this space here, starts to increase. Piston moves down until it hits around here. End up giving as much bigger working volume. So pressure's dropping. Volume's going up. Once we hit the bottom dead center, or in other words, the lowest point this piston bore can hit, the inlet valve shuts. So this is now a closed system. And then it starts to come back up. So this is the compression stage. It's reducing the working volume of the fuel. And the air. And once it gets somewhere near the top, we get an ignition from the spark plug. So a big ignition occurs, burns the fuel with the air in a controlled manner, and that produces a huge amount of power and energy to push the piston back down. Power stroke is technically the only valuable or useful part of this stage, this process, very inefficient. Once it hits the bottom dead center, up it goes, kicks the exhaust gases back out, ready to start all over again. Right. Let's quickly discard that. This is just a bit of information to uh, explain what happens then. So pressure volume curve. Right, first thing that happens then, this graph does not start at the origin because if it started down here, it means there's no pressure, there's no volume, there's no temperature, there's no energy. It's basically, you're saying it doesn't exist. So this graph will start somewhere up here. It's got pressure, it's got a starting volume. The first thing that happens is the piston came down. Whilst the inlet valve is open, it's an open system. So although the volume goes up, the pressure doesn't. Once it hits the bottom dead center, so this is roughly where the bottom dead center is going to be, it closes the inlet valve, closed system through the compression stage. Pressure's going up and up and up and up. It's the top. We get the ignition. So there's a huge amount of temperature being produced up increases the pressure dramatically very small change in volume once it enters the power stroke it comes back down and typically what you find is the end pressure is slightly higher than it starts at exhaust valve opens starts all over again right so there's ignition roughly what you should find if you look at piston engines, is the compression part roughly looks the same as the power stage. Now, obviously, not very well at the scale, but the concept is top dead center and bottom dead center. Very well drawn graph. 
So top dead center will have high pressure. Bottom dead center has low high volume, obviously. The distance between the two of them. Is the stroke. Right. Concept here then is in the power stage, this is connected to a dry shaft. That dry shaft will be connected to a gearbox or a reduction gearbox rather slows the angular velocity of the rod down and starts to spin the propeller attached to the end. Now, piston engines, if you think of your car, primarily affected by only a handful of things. But the size, so this is the volume. So obviously you talk about cars having two litres, three litres, same concept. The bigger the volume, the more it can produce. You stick more cylinders in. So if you've got your basic first level Corsa, might be a three cylinder car. You can get your V8 engine. So it's got eight cylinders, more cylinders, more power coming out. And finally, the density of the air. Uh, Right, density is very approximate, a rough statement, because density affects the temperature, it affects the pressure. This is a very famous equation for aerodynamics, is the equation of state. So telling you that the pressure at any particular point is equal to the density multiplied by the temperature and R is the ideal gas constant. Right. First formula then to you talk about. If you take a piston engine at sea level, it's going to produce an output. You take that same piston engine to an altitude, three, four, five thousand feet, it's going to produce less power, so it has less available power. And that is because of the density ratio involved. So it's shaft horsepower because it's driven by dry shafts, it's power rate, its engine. Value at sea level multiplied by the density at your altitude divided by the density at sea level. Right. Turbo jets. Very similar to turbo fans. Few things to mention here. Very quickly go over the concepts. You'll do an, a module on this, no doubt. Same stages occur as the piston engine. We've got all events occurring an intake. You've got the compression. You've got the power from the combustion. You've got the power stage out. In this case, it's the turbine. Kick it all out. Start all over again. Now, right. the big difference is each of these events are simultaneously happening. They just have to occur at different locations. Right, so air comes in, we compress it, we burn the fuel to add heat energy, which is extracted from the power turbine out through the exhaust. A turbo dress can have a few around here, an afterburner, and basically the thrust that comes out the engine 
might not be enough to surpass Mac 1, for example. Hit the afterburners, it injects more fuel. Around here. Produces a significant amount more thrust out the back. Obviously, Newton's third law says it's going to go forwards in that sense. Right. The turbo fan works on exactly the same principle. You've got a core. So some of the air will come in and go through the engine we just discussed. But typically, a significant amount might start to a bit exaggerated, but just for the concept. Quite a large amount of air might start to travel around the bypass. Right, bigger the bypass, the more air travels through it. More air that travels through the bypass, the bigger the thrust is going to be. And I'll explain the concept of that in the next slide here. Right, so turbo jets, this is without the bypass, but with an afterburner. Very good for high subsonic, transonic, and supersonic flights. Can't emphasize that it's only turbo jets where you've got the thrust augmentation, so the afterburner. Right, Newton's second law involved in this. Second law, F equals MA, rate of change in momentum. You're changing the mass, you're changing acceleration, you're producing a lot of force. Third law, equal and opposite reaction. So you push something backwards, it wants to push forwards as well. All right. The two engines then. This bit, the exit velocity minus the inlet velocity is the concept of the turbo jet. Basically, the faster you can make the air come out compared to what goes in, the better gives you the thrust. The turbo fan, however, relies on this bit. The bigger the mass flow that you can get through the engine, this is the bigger the bypass, if you like. Don't bother about the, the core, just enough to power everything. Then the bigger the thrust is going to be. So, you can either increase the mass flow around the bypass or increase the exit velocity compared to the inlet. All right. Turbo jets have a very similar concepts which affect the output of the engine. We've got air density and air velocity. The velocity speaks for itself. Velocity involved, the bigger the velocity difference, the better. The air density, I'm going to start to drive that bit. And that is because mass flow is density area velocity. You start to increase that, you increase the mass flow. All right, starting with the turbo jet, it can be corrected. So just like the piston engine, it can be at sea level. It can have a density value or its altitude, a density value at sea level, produces a thrust out. You can take your turbo jet, you can stick an afterburner on it. Afterburners rapidly increase the thrust, so increases by 50%. But typically, these are just ballpark figures. Obviously, no engines is the same. It can increase the fuel flow by 100%. In other words, double the amount of fuel required to get the afterburners to go. Right, these are your technical terms. The turbo jet, we can have a dry or military state, which is the form you can see here. This is the dry or military form here. 
Or you can then go wet, where the wet means the exhaust system is wet with fuel, ready for the afterburner. You can ignite it, it can have a maximum output. So the afterburners are on. Slightly different formula. You'll see the same core with a bolt on here. So engine is before. It's then got the afterburner effect. Right. One thing I want to mention is this bit here. Very easy to forget 0.7. And so you got a question that says the Mach number is 0.71. It's very easy to forget 0.7 that goes with it. You'll just be a little bit wary about that one. These graphs stick with the turbo jet. The concept with this is, is it shows you the amount of thrust produced at sea level. 10,000 feet, 20, 30, 40, as you increase it, the one on the right shows you what happens when you stick the afterburners on. So you'll say the sea level, thrust for example, little over 4,000 in this instance, whack the afterburners on, the thrust rapidly jumps and starts at 6,000. So it's adding about 50% in this case, as you can see. The thrust required as you go further up, or the thrust produce, decreases and decreases with altitudes. And then that is a simple fact because the density and temperature involved. All right, turbofan engine. So this is very much the same. Turbofan produces the thrust very slightly differently. It's got the bypass that goes around the edge. Only a small, book, small bit goes through the core to power the engine itself to get the compressor blade spinning. The more air you get around the bypass, the better. It basically produces a bigger mass flow without requiring any extra weight consumption or fuel consumption, which means you get the better or lower thrust specific Fuel value. All right. You can have two types a low bypass engine. So this is where anything less than five to one. Anything less than five to one. So that's meaning there's your core, there's the bypass. For every one kilogram that goes through the middle, five kilograms have to go around the outside. So anything less than five, we've got a model like a turbo jet. As soon as you exceed five to one, you've got what would be classed as turbo fan. Right. Similarly, it's got its own thrust correction. You see the same bit again, thrust to sea level, the density ratio, so that bit never changes, that's the core aspect if you like. And then we've got the bypass part to consider. So 0.1 divided by the Mach number, the aircraft travel and that will give us our corrected value. Turbo fans. Not really much to say about these graphs, so we'll quickly jump on to turbo prop engines. Right, turbo props. This is another gas turbine engine. Only we we'll go for the basic diagram. Compressor. Combustor, the board, this is the simple bow tie diagram. There's your turbine, and then out it goes. Right. What happens is as the air goes through the core, 
So most of this will go through the core section. There's the combustor, it hits the turbine, and this turbine section here will power up drive shafts. And at the end of this drive shaft, you will have a propeller. Right, so the fuel and energy you put into here from the combustor is used to power this, which drives the propeller at the front. And then the other turbine sections generally drive the compressor section and any other gearboxes involved. We have very much like a turbo fan until you get to high Mach numbers, it loses its effectiveness. That's simply because of the propeller and the shockwave concept. The thrust correction for this one is equivalent shaft horsepower involved. So what this means is because it's a propeller, it will produce power. But because of the jet engine, it will have thrust aspects. So what happens here? There's a quick diagram again just for this. What happens here is most of the energy or thrust is produced by our propeller at the front. But because there's a jet engine, we're burning some fuel in the combustor. These hot gases are getting pushed out into the exhaust section. And that produces an equal and opposite reaction. So we've got a mixture of the shaft power for the propeller and such concept from not leaving the engine exhaust. Right. Create uh, the terms very much the same. Density, the altitude, density at the sea level, the speed the aircraft's going. And this time, E to P is the propeller efficiency. And you generally be given that value if you need it. Right, finally, the Altitude difference sea level to wherever the aircraft's flying will affect the thrust specific fuel consumption. The first, the two ways to do this first one is the CT or the thrust specific fuel consumption at sea level is multiplied by the square root of temperature at the altitude temperature at sea level on the bottom to give us the output out. So this formula comes about because on top, the alternative version says if the specific fuel consumption is equal to that at sea level times the ratio of speed of sound and speed of sound at sea level. So if we go back to this up here, the speed of sound is calculated by taking gamma which is 1.4 for air. The ideal gas constant, which is about 287 on the data sheets, and the temperature and square root and all of that. Right, so you can see when you do this in this, your temperatures are different. But your gamma value is constant, it's just a number, R is just a number, and cancel each other out. Right, so just for clarification, gamma. 1.403, it's the ratio of specific heats. You may have met that in thermodynamics. Oh. There's our ideal gas constant, and this has two values, depending on the metric system or the imperial system. This is off the data sheet as well. It's 
276 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Or I think it's 1716. I haven't got it in front of me. 1716 pounds, but for rank nine. Irrespectively, all three values there are given on the data sheet. Right, quick summary. So, propeller based aircraft can be given in a thrust, even though the power rated engines, and we do that with the quick conversion. The bypass engine is split into two. You've got the bypass itself. You've got the turbojet, which is typically the core. So this is only viable for 0 0.9 and below Mach number. And that's because you need the afterburners to get beyond Mach 1, hence the addition to that. Right, quick example. This has a solution in the PowerPoint on Blackboard, but here we go. The idea here is you've got an engine under sea level conditions and an afterburner condition. So it's normal state, afterburners on. Most of the thrust produced, what's the TF, F, sorry, the thrust specific fuel consumption value change based on 21,000 fees, 0.85 math. Right. From the question, there's a thrust, there's the thrust specific fuel consumption value. For the joy, a repeat for the wet, so the afterburner condition and some key values that you're going to need to stick into the formulas. All right, starting with the military. It's after burners are off, so we've got the very fundamental equation. The thrusted sea level was 62,250. And you can see on the previous slide that we read the density at altitudes, the density at sea level, and the thrust should drop. Beneath that, we've got the speed of sound over the speed of sound at sea level. Again, as I say, you can use the square root of the temperatures, but you will need to convert to Kelvin. Very similar method for the afterburner. The only thing you need to be aware of, I say, it's 0 0.7 times the Mach number, so that's 0 0.7 times 0 0.8 by rate. But again, the thrust drops, as does the thrust specific fuel consumption. All right, that rounds the first session off on the engines and the thrust corrections. The thrust corrections are arguably the most important part, along with getting familiar with the units involved.